Good evening. Welcome to the regular governing board meeting of the Fairfield Sioux Unified School District. Can we have a roll call, please? Ms. Smith? Here. Ms. Honeychurch? Here. Ms. Tilly? Here. Mr. Flynn? Here. Ms. Patero? Here. Mr. Polk? Here. Mr. Wilson? Here. Okay, we have a couple of items that are going to be pulled from the agenda because they are bids and they're going to be rebid. So I am going to ask for an approval of the agenda, a motion for that, uh, minus 12Q and 12S. Is there a motion? I would move approval with those amendments. Second. Can someone second the motion? Second. She did. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Um, we will be adjourning the closed session for discussion and possible action on matters of student discipline, personnel, negotiations, <laughs> and litigation. Is there any public comment on closed session agenda? I have not received any. Okay, then we are adjourned to closed session.
Good evening. Welcome to the regular governing board meeting of the Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District, a meeting of the board in public and not a public meeting. Um, can we please uh, stand for the pledge? Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the... Can we please have a report of action taken in closed session? Yes, thank you, President Smith. In the matter of student discipline, no action was taken. In the matter with conference with labor negotiators, no action taken. Matter, matter with conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation pursuant to government code section 54956.9, parentheses D, parentheses two, no action taken. In the matter of public employment, it is my honor to announce that by unanimous vote, the board affirmed the appointment of Monica Gonzalez Ibarra as assistant director, child nutrition. Where is Monica? Stand. Where are you? Stand. And this is effective March 22nd. And I'm going to read just a little bit about Monica. Um, she, in her current role as child nutrition manager for FSUSD, supervises daily cafeteria tasks to ensure compliance with state and federal requirements, evaluates food staff performance, assists in recruitment, training, and employee personnel matters. She also manages food ordering, delivering, and communicates with uh, vendors. In her new role, um, she will bring nine years of experience in the department to oversee staff and cafeterias throughout the district and make sure our students receive great nutritional meals each and every day. She has an Associates of Art degree from Eastern Gateway College and has taken classes in billing and coding from the University of Phoenix. And what's really special is she is a maiden FSUSD who graduated as a Fairfield Falcon. And so we are very excited um, with the official appointment of Ms. Mc Monica Gonzalez Ibarra as our Assistant Director of Child Nutrition. Congratulations. One. Um, also, in the matter of public employment, um, our board, by a vote of 6-1, with Anna Patero dissenting, um, the board affirmed the appointment of Sherry McCormick as our itinerant administrator, effective July 1st, 2024. And I know Sherry's here. Um, not going to read a bunch about Sherry because she has been in the district uh, for quite a while. She has currently at the as at Anna Kyle as assistant principal. She has been a principal at the elementary level and at alternative high school, and she has a high school experience as assistant principal. And she also has been a teacher in our district. And so, congratulations on your new employment. Also, um, by a vote of 6-1 with Anna Patero dissenting, um, the board has appoint, affirmed the appointment of James Hightower as an itinerant administrator, effective July 2024. Hightower is in here, um, but he has uh, also elementary, middle, and high school experience. He has been the, an alternative high school experience. He's been the principal at Seminary 7. Um, he was the principal. He was a math teacher at Sullivan Middle School when it was a middle school, and he, um, we learned that he was a student teacher at Bransford Elementary with Miss Liz Teresi as his <laughs> master teacher. So um, congratulations to Mr. Hightower. Um, by unanimous vote, our board affirmed the appointment of Katie Lee as Coordinator of Educational Services Special Projects. And I don't know if Katie, is Katie here? She is. There she is. And this is effective July 1st. She will be um, responsible for building up and strengthening the IB program at Armio High School and also the GATE program throughout the district. Katie is also not new to our district. She's been a principal of the Public Safety Academy for three years. She's been an assistant principal there and a sixth grade teacher there. Um, she taught at Oak Brook, Rolling Hills, and at B. Gil Wilson, and we're excited to have you in this new role. Congratulations, Katie. By unanimous vote, our board affirmed the appointment of Kar um, Karina 
Cal, well, gosh, I say it wrong all the time. Cal and Tony, as our assistant principal at Armio High School, effective July 1st, 2024. And you can stand, because our wave, you're here. She is not new to our district. She has been our um, princi assistant principal at David Weir for the last year. She was a counselor, um, and a secondary education counselor, and she was also a counselor at Armio, so she's going back home to be a royal. Um, so congratulations. This will be a new position that is funded out um, from Title I dollars, and so it'll be a little bit different than a, the typical assistant principal role, but congratulations. And that begins July 1st. And with that, there was no other action taken. All right, thank you very much. Well, I do not have an opening statement tonight, so we will go right into recognitions. And we have our Students of the Month uh, for, uh, for March, and Vice President Honeychurch and Student Board Member Madadi will go ahead and make those presentations. Good evening, all right. Could I please have Ileana Wab come forward, please? Ileana? Ileana Wab, a fifth grader from the Dover Elementary, has been selected as one of the district's students of the month for March 2024. Ileana is a dedicated student who is committed to her academics. She is an enthusiastic, self-motivated learner who strives to do well in school. Ileana lives with her mom, older sister, and brother-in-law, whom she loves very much. Ileana aspires to go to college. Her mom is an inspiration. Ileana enjoys spending time with her family. She loves to watch TV with her mom, do arts and crafts, and play games with her family. She also likes taking naps on the weekend. <laughs> Ileana loves to go to the beach and see the ocean. She likes to help her classmates with math because that is her favorite subject. We congratulate you, Ileana, for being honored tonight as one of the district's Students of the Month for March. Thank you, you Superintendent Corey, Corey, President Smith, and, and the Governing Board. I am grateful for the honor of being Student of the Month for Dover. Dover. Thank, Thank you to my family, especially my mom, for always encouraging me and supporting me with school. I appreciate all the teachers, teachers I have had at Dover from my principal, Mrs. Johnson. Johnson. I plan to use all the skills that Ms. Prosser and Ms. Lukens has taught me over the last two years to be successful in sixth grade. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Good job. We're going to go take our picture now, okay?
Can we have any of the Dover teachers stand and wave, please? Where are the Dover teachers? Next, could I please have Diana Castro Gonzalez come forward? Congratulations. Diana Castro Gonzalez, an eighth grader from Grange Middle School, has been selected as one of the district's Students of the Month for March 2024. Diana is one of the most dedicated and humble students at Grange Middle School. She always gives her best effort every single day, inside and outside the classroom. She is kind to her classmates, respectful to everyone on campus, and is always willing to help translate for her Spanish-speaking classmates. She is one of the top performing students who does not settle for anything other than perfection in her work. When she is not at school, she enjoys hanging out with her friends and her family. When she gets older, Diana would like to pursue a career in either medical or law field. With her determination and worth ethic, we have no doubt she will have a successful career in her future. We congratulate you, Diana, for being honored tonight as one of the district's Students of the Month for March. Congratulations. Good evening, Superintendent Corey, Board President Smith, Board members, and community members. It's an honor being here today and being acknowledged and elected as 2024 Student of the Month for Grange Middle School. I'd like to thank you all for this opportunity. Your support and guidance has encouraged me to work harder, achieve my goals, and pursue my dreams of working in the medical or law field. I'd also like to thank my family for always encouraging me to do my best and work hard for my education. To my family, thanks to your sacrifices, love, and support, you've all made me into the hardworking person I am today. Your encouraging and heartfelt advice has impacted me tons and has helped me grow as an individual. Your help continues to help me push forward and reach my dreams and goals. Being a student of the month truly means a lot to me. It makes me feel extremely special to be able to represent Grange Middle School. I never thought I'd be standing here today and be receiving this reward. Again, thank you all for this opportunity. It's an honor being here and receiving such an incredible reward. Not sure if we have any Grange teachers here. I know we have a Grange retiree here. Uh, any Grange teachers? Awesome. Okay. Okay. Could we please have Isaac come up here? Isaac Lane Cruz, a fifth grader from Laurel Creek Elementary School, has been selected as one of the district students of the month for March. Isaac has attended Laurel Creek for six years, first enrolling in kindergarten. 
a mainstay in every classroom that he has been in, Isaac is the type of student who stands out by not standing out. He's the classic leader by example. Isaac can be counted on to help other students give his best effort at all times and regularly display acts of kindness towards those around him. Isaac has been an honor roll student in all quarters as a fourth and fifth grader. During recess, he can be found out in the field participating in competitive kickball games unless he decides to play basketball on that day. After homework is done or on the weekends, Isaac will join his older brothers in the living room playing video games. He's considering computer engineering as a career as it aligns with his interest in gaming and how technology can help us. We congratulate you, Isaac, for being honored tonight as one of the district students of the month for March. Good evening, Superintendent Quinley, Board President Smith, board members and members of the community. This opportunity I wouldn't be here without the support of my family who has always stuck by me and supported me. Mom, Dad, and Alex, you've been amazing and I'm thankful for all of that you've done. Mrs. Fox, thank you for being a great teacher and thank you to all my other local teachers. Now I feel like I'm ready for middle school and pursuing a career in computer engineering. Thank you again for honoring me tonight. saw Miss Fox standing. Now you need to wave, our very Laurel Creek teacher. Could I please have Ariel come up here? Ariel He Wong, an eighth grader from Virtual Academy of Fairfield Sassoon, has been selected as one of the district students of the month for March. Ariel's journey at Virtual Academy is marked by outstanding achievements and impactful contributions. With a stellar 4.0 GPA across all four years, Ariel has demonstrated unwavering commitment to academic excellence. Her leadership extends beyond the classroom as a valued member of the Sassoon City Youth Commission, Fairfield Cordelia Library Teen Advisory Board, Superintendents Committee, and the Student Advisory Council. She's the captain and project manager of the Chess Club, editor of the school newspaper, and co-creator of Phoenix Advisors, our student buddy program. In addition, Ariel helped to coordinate with Travis Credit Union to bring financial literacy classes to Virtual Academy. Ariel has proven to be an exemplary student leader, leaving a lasting positive impact on her school and peers. Beyond the realm of achievements and contributions, Ariel embodies kindness and a focus on the positive, embracing a mindset of gratitude that uplifts those around her. In her free time, she enjoys playing chess, photography, drawing, and exercising. We congratulate you, Ariel, for being honored tonight as one of the district students of the month for March.
Good evening, Superintendent Corey, Board President Smith, governing board members, and members of the community. I am so grateful to be here and represent Student of the Month for March. First, thank you, Ms. Hutchinson, for creating such a lovely and fun environment around Virtual Academy. Thank you to Mr. Patton and Mrs. Taylor for your creative ways of teaching and keeping us on track while also making learning enjoyable. Thank you, Mr. Knott, for teaching me to love the game of chess, which has made a big difference in my school years. Lastly, thank you to my family for always supporting me. In the fall, I am looking forward to interning in person at Rodriguez High School, while I will still be happy to help with events at my previous schools. Afterwards, I plan on attending a four-year college. Thank you again for honoring me as District Student of the Month. And I see some virtual academy staff in the crowd. If you'd please stand and wave. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, um, we will go ahead and take a little pause here so that you guys can go and celebrate with your families, all of our uh, individuals with promotions and students of the month and babies who are having their first birthday, unless you want to leave her here, I'm just saying. <laughs> And Monica, <laughs> we have a made an FSUSD pin for you. <laughs> Okay, we are now to our public communication. This is the opportunity for the public to address items that are not on the board meeting agenda. Public comment is only permitted on matters within subject matter jurisdiction of the board. And there will be three minutes per speaker. Uh, Madam Clerk, I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Madam President. So uh, we have a number of speakers this evening. Uh, the first being Stephanie uh, Elias. 
Elias. I even asked her. Good evening, my name is Stephanie Elias and I am here reluctantly as a parent who has exhausted all other options. My son Eric has experienced consistent bullying by one of his classmates for months. We have reported it each and every time with no resolution. He has experienced not only homophobic and racial slurs, but has also been physically assaulted on multiple occasions, including one in particular incident where my son who was born with multiple complex heart conditions was kicked in his chest. by this student. Just this week, I received a written letter stating that my son's complaints against this student over the last several months has been substantiated, meaning the school has done an investigation and has agreed that my son is in fact being bullied. But again, the only option granted to my son was to change classes. This is not only unfair to him, but does not deal with the true issue, nor does it prevent other, ex other students from experiencing what my son has. These ongoing issues have created an unsafe and inadequate learning environment, not only for my son, but also the other students, including the teacher who was unable to keep her students safe in the classroom and has gotten no support in doing so. Where is the accountability for the very negative behavior? And how can we expect that behavior to change without corrective action? I have been told countless times that this by the school, I'm sorry, I have been told countless times that the school is dealing with this issue within the bounds of their guidelines handed down by this board. As a parent, fearing for their son's safety, it, this is extremely disheartening. I have sought I have sought external advice and will continue down this road of, if we continue down this road of the same, I fully intend to file a police report so that we are involving others who may take the situation more seriously. I have also been left with no other choice but to contact the union that represents and protects my son's teacher in hopes that she will also get some support in keeping her classroom safe. This again is not creating I'm sorry, this again is not only creating an inadequate and unsafe learning environment, but has also, but is also an absolute dereliction of duty by all involved. You are put in these positions to set a standard of learning throughout the district, and my experience in this process makes it extremely apparent how woefully inadequate, inadequate these processes are, and how little regard there is for the I'd ask the audience to please not clap or do any other responses to public comment. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Sharia Shernavasan. And just out of inquiry, we also have Marion Salmeron, Marley Rickabaugh, Lily Stukas, and Quinn Aftab, are you all together here? Okay, great, thanks. Board Smith, governing board members, and members of the community. My name is Shreya Srinivasan. I am 15 years old and attend the early college high school program at Solana Community College. Today, we are here to urge FSUSD's governing board to write a letter of support for AB 2229, legislation advocating for comprehensive menstrual education in all California schools. AB 2229 will help ensure that teens are educated regarding important menstrual health topics such as the menstrual cycle, premenstrual syndrome and pain management, menstrual disorders, and other related menstrual topics. The curriculum will also address the taboos and stigmas associated with education. Lack of mandated menstrual education means many students miss out on understanding the basics from managing cramps healthily to recognizing disorders and accessing hygiene progress. Stigma and a sense of education jeopardize but 
four out of five menstruating teens have either missed class time or know someone who has because they don't have the resources they need to navigate their period. When I was 12 years old, I lost my period for three years and had no idea why. When I searched up why I don't have my period, I fell into a rabbit hole full of misinformation. Different websites told me it could be anything to a tumor, to diabetes, to a thyroid disorder, and I didn't know which sources to trust. Overwhelmed and terrified, I swore never to tell my family because I didn't want to scare them too. It wasn't until I sought medical help from a running injury that I was hit with the facts about my missing period. Even with the sex education I received on reproductive health in fifth, seventh, and ninth grades, I hadn't learned about what a period was, how to regulate one, how to care for one, and especially how to notice irregularities. That's why I'm fighting for new legislation, AB 2229, that will help young people across the state understand and navigate their periods. Since starting this campaign five months ago, we have built a base of over 1,000 youth in California who support this legislation. Over time, we, the members of Solana Community College's Reproductive Health Club, have been talking with fellow students both far and near about their ask for comprehensive menstrual education. My period should have never been a mystery to me, and I never should have suffered in the silence because of the misinformation and shame. If we work together to adopt the Know Your Period curriculum, we could provide a source of relief and empowerment for thousands of students across the state. I respectfully urge the FSUSD Governing Board to consider offering a letter of support for AB 2229, recognizing our request as a step towards advocating for comprehensive menstrual education. Thank you for your time. Do you each wish, wish to speak or do you wish to affirm? Okay, then uh, the next person in order would be Marion Salmeron. Um, sorry, that was so loud. <laughs> Good evening, Dr. McCaw, Board President Smith, Governing Board members, and members of the community. My name is Marion Salmeron. I'm 16 years old. I'm a California constituent based in Fairville. I'm currently attending Early College High School and I'm the Secretary of Reproductive Health Club at Sol Solano Community College. I get asked the question, why did I decide to support comprehensive menstrual health? The only answer I can come up with is that it's a topic that has to be implemented in education. As a menstruator, I can only think about the benefits that can come from it. The opportunities to learn about your own body would be endless. Having a space to ask questions and to, and to expand your knowledge is nothing but helpful. Looking at the menstrual education that was provided in my life, it was nothing but vague. It, it would briefly go over topics that were considered common sense. Little did everyone know that for many of those common sense topics was new information to them. As a little girl, I had to learn everything on my own with only the slight glimpses that were given by menstrual education in high school. Even to this day, I'm still learning about the several topics in the branch of menstrual health. The implementation of AB 2229 will help menstruators get more information on their cycles or even just help set a better platform for the topics they already know. My personal experience with menstrual education, I can barely recall how it e even went. Instead of a lesson, it felt like a statement. To me, it seemed like they said, menstruators have periods, here's a pad and tampon. Due to this, I want to emphasize the absence and vagueness of the matter. The lack of distinction on the topics created more confusion and stigma instead of providing a knowledgeable environment. In order to improve upon the menstrual education, the focus should switch on to the following topics, scientific me and medical accuracy, disorders and irre irregularities, hygiene and stigma. When focusing on these topics, the vagueness would be out of the equation. It would provide actual facts about the menstru menstrual he menstruator health, creating an open and learning environment for all. AB 229 would cover all these topics and more. I respectfully urge the FSUSD Governing Board to consider offering a letter of support for AB 2229, recognizing our request as a step towards advocating for comprehensive menstrual health education. That's it, sorry. And the next speaker is Marley Rickaboff. Good evening, Dr. McCabe, Board President Smith, governing board members and members of the community. I'm your constituent based in Fairfield, California, and my name is Marley Rickabaugh. I'm 15 years old and attend Early College High School program at Solano Community College. I'm the public relations officer at Solano Community College's Reproductive Health Club. I support comprehensive menstrual education because it would correct the misinformation that students receive from sources outside of school, as well as decrease its taboo status. As a menstruator myself, I never learned about menstruation until the sixth grade when one of my school friends got theirs and told me what it was. Hearing that I would eventually start bleeding out of my vagina both confused and terrified me. 
When I finally got mine in seventh grade, I was humiliated and didn't want anyone figuring out the dark secret I was hiding. It wasn't until eighth grade that my school, that my school briefly went over the menstrual cycle, only mentioning the biological effects and failing to mention anything regarding the psychological and physical effects, the stigma, or what and how products are used. However, even the brief and vague overview made me feel a bit less ashamed and more normal. So I know that a curriculum that provides comprehensive mental education would help many students feel more comfortable and confident with their periods. AB 2229 would source a comprehensive curriculum that would discuss premenstrual syndrome, both the mental and physical effects, what products to use and how to do so, hygiene, irregularities and diseases associated with it, and how to deal with cramps and body aches. It would also specifically address the stigma, how it can be decreased, and what non-menstruators can do to support their menstruating counterparts. California's current sexual education program fails to provide the comprehensive menstrual education that is necessary for a decreasing period poverty, which is described by the National Library of Education as the lack of access to safe and hygienic menstrual products during monthly periods and inaccessibility to basic sanitation services or facilities, as well as menstrual hygiene education. AB 2229 would give students the access to this menstrual hygiene education, thus resulting in less shame, stigma, and period poverty. I respectfully urge the FSUSD Governing Board to consider offering a letter of support for AB 2229 recognizing our requests as a step towards advocating for comprehensive menstrual education. Thank you for your time. The next speaker is Lily um, Stukas. Did I say that right? Yeah, you did. Uh, good evening, Dr. McCabe, board member President Smith, government board members, and members of the community. My name is Lily Stukas. I'm a junior at Early College High School. And I want to start off by mentioning my own personal experience with this district's reproductive health curriculum. In, the ele in elementary school, I had none. It was cut off that year. In middle school, none. <laughs> in high school, they taught me that STIs are bad. And although that's important knowledge, I learned virtually nothing related to menstrual health. I knew so little. I was never taught anything. I mean, I thought PMS was what people called you when you were being difficult. I was told that a tampon takes your virginity. Um, it took me almost a year to realize that you could take the plastic off of a pad, <laughs> which is crazy to me now. Um, and when I lost my period for four months during swim season, I was told it was completely normal. <laughs> Not until this year, when conducting my own research, did I learn the facts about any of this. All I knew that was that when my stepsister told me, when I was hyperventilating in the bathroom because I found blood in my underwear, was it happens to all females during puberty. Blood comes out of you for a week, and it's gone when you're an old lady. And that was all I was ever taught. That's, that was it. I was scared, and I was confused, and I was completely unprepared. And I guarantee I would not have felt this way if I were given the comprehensive menstrual education, education I needed. And this is why it's so important. We deserve to know what's going on with our bodies. No one can decide to take away a human's right to education on basic human functions. Our, months, our menstruators deserve better. We need to stand together and fight for the rights of all people with uteruses to have the resources and education they need to navigate their developmental years and their period as a whole through their, throughout their entire life. California young menstruators don't need your prejudice, they, don't need your, they need your support, and they need comprehensive menstrual education. All students, all students in California need to know about menstrual irregularities and syndromes, their hormone cycle, the cycles of menstruation, um, hygiene management, local resources, and especially how to destigmatize the menstrual stigmas. Yeah. Um, AB 229 would cover all of these topics and more. I respectfully urge the FSUSD Governing Board to consider offering a letter of support for AB 2229, recognizing our request as a step towards advocating for comprehensive menstrual education. Thank you. Uh, our final speaker is uh, Quinn. Uh, no, yeah, Quinn Agda. I just want to say, folks, I'm not sure if it's intentional, but. Um, 
the superintendent is Chris Corey. Dr. McCabe's over there. We're happy to have her. She's in charge of education, but just a reminder that it's nice for you to welcome them, but we do have a sitting superintendent. Go ahead. Good evening, Dr. McCabe, Superintendent Corey, Board President Smith, Governing Board members, and members of the community. My name is Quinn Aftab, and I'm 16 years old. I am in the Early College High School program at Solano Community College, and I am a Con California Constitute based in Fairfield. To almost all of us in this room, it's clear that education is important. It's clear that education and passion have granted us with knowledge that allows us to enhance our own experiences. Yet, education is big not only for pursuing our passions, but also for understanding ourselves. So my question is, why not include menstrual education? Why take away the power of knowledge? As a menstruator, from a young age, I'm familiar with feeling socially ashamed and ostracized in my community, both inside and outside of school because of my own body, which is something I've been encouraged to be silent about. Difficulties with managing and interpreting the experiences of my period would have been significantly eased by education. And yes, I have received some education in my science classrooms. Although California schools are required to teach similar topics, they do not cover important aspects of menstruation, such as the diversity of symptoms and menstrual hygiene and health management. I believe that if these components were embedded into the education curriculum, we could refine the knowledge of many students in our school, menstruators or not. It will help us bridge the absence of knowledge for everyone. I ask the members of the FSUSD board to consider the lived experiences and support of students across California and support comprehensive menstrual education. In conclusion, I respectfully urge the FSUSD governing board to consider offering a letter of support for AB 2229, recognizing our request as a step towards advocating for comprehensive menstrual health education. Thank you for your time. There are no more public speakers, Madam President. Thank you. All right, then we will go to the consent calendar. Um, are there any items to be pulled from the consent calendar? Madam President, I would like to, if I may, pull 8G and 10F from the consent calendars, please. 10F? 8G and 10F. Okay. Sorry, I have a note over here that you were pulling 10G, so. Okay. Let's just we'll give, we'll, we'll give one second to um, allow our uh, staff to pull the um, correct item. I, I was just going to move to approve the calendar with... Um, the uh, items 8G and 10F pulled. Okay, thank you. Second. Okay. You're ready? Yeah. Okay, you, and you have the motion and the second already? Yeah. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Then we will go to 8G. Okay. Ready? So thank you. I, these, are, these questions are just for clarification. If the staff could answer them today or if they would feel free to answer them in, in a message later on. The question I had was regarding the transportation. And just to follow up when the response on partners have a cost, I would just like to know like who pays and what the cost is to the students get bus passes, like free bus passes to go to and from school. On This wasn't mentioned on the transportation. That's one of the questions. Can they want to know what the cost of city transportation is? So, transportation op options with Solano Partners have a cost. I want to know if, if the students have like a free bus pass to get to and from school with this. Does, is that under that or what the, what the cost was? Because that wasn't listed in the Okay. In the, so the cost in of the local message. transportation. Yeah. yeah. Right. And yeah. So that was one of them. Uh, the other one was on the 42 percent of students that are transported who are considered unduplicated. Like how many students that come out, that comes out to? Because we transport like 354 students to and from school who are disabled. So it's 42 percent of them. So 42 percent. All the 342 students are considered unduplicated. And so they 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 get okay. That was that on, on HG. And One we on probably won't know that off the top of our heads with the... That's the, okay. So That's we'll okay. get that back yeah. to you. Okay. If, if that could be answered at a later time, that would be fine. 
Do you want on H on, on t my my response on ten F? No, let's go ahead and um, vote on eight G. And I would just say if it's you know clarification questions, then maybe just address it outside of this, and then we don't have to pull the item. Um, okay. So is there a motion on eight G? Yeah, I would move to approve it. Okay. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. And oh, I'm sorry. I, you're going to have to remind me um, because we have the preferential vote. I'm, I apologize. Oh. Oh. <laughs> it's a new process tonight. Okay. Um, Do we already have her accounted yeah. for, though? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, 10F, then. On the land, land acknowledgement. So I have a problem with this, an issue with this, because I feel like I've attended a funeral a few years ago. And at that funeral, the pastor said, we die twice. Once we die a physical death, the second time we die when nobody mentions our name again. This land acknowledgement, I think, is important to be read out loud and acknowledge the fact that people lived here. We occupy land upon which people have already, were already here. So to me, I, I read the, the attachment. Solano Community College is the only one that has it written. The other school boards actually have either a trustee read it or somebody they hand it down to people to read or the board president reads this. It's 45 seconds. And if we want to acknowledge the people in whose land we occupy, I think putting them in the background in a screen is further putting them in the background. It doesn't hurt anything. It's 45 seconds. I move that we read this, saying the names of the people who occupied this land before we did. It's important that their names never die. They've died a physical death due to cultural genocide. We shouldn't continue that. We should keep their names alive by reading, the least we could do is read their land acknowledgement and acknowledge that they exist at, at least once a month for 45 seconds at our board meetings. I would move that we read the land acknowledgement as opposed to having it in the background. Second. It's just a bad look on so many levels. Did I hear you second that? Yeah. Okay, is there board discussion? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so I do support the, um, <laughs> sorry, uh, I do support having this read. Um, I think that as board members, I think it's just important that we be thoughtful in this process, realize that we have so many of our community partners um, that may, that, that this is so important to them. Um, it may be a short amount of time, but it makes a huge difference. And so I do support this, and I would urge the board to uh, vote yes on the motion. Thank you. Ms. Tilly. Thank you uh, for both the impassioned and understandable desire to rectify years of um, misinformation. Uh, having said that, I support the recommendation of the committee. There was a spirited debate about this, and in fact, um, board member Polk uh, was the one who said, you know, let's also put it up on the days here because these meetings are filmed. And so when people come to YouTube and they're watching the, 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 the screen, mm -hmm. all they're going to have to read is the acknowledgement. And so I thought it was an, it was an effort to amplify mm -hmm. and to extend the message beyond simply uh, rote recitation during the meeting. I also um, wanted to thank staff for surveying uh, all, so many of our educational partners. And another reason that we recommended to, uh, that the resolution that is before us, uh, including uh, access to our webpage as well as having it on the agenda, uh, was that that's exactly what Solano Community College does. And I felt that consistency in the region with our educational partners was a good thing to do. I also uh, don't wish to um, minimize other groups that would also like to have access to um, uh, remediation, if, as it were, using our board meetings as a vehicle for that. So I support the recommendation um, and the resolution is drafted. There was a lot of thought and discussion and work that went into it, so I would vote against uh, the motion to force a reading. 
Mr. Wilson. My understanding is that the agenda item proposal will bring us in step with comparable government agencies around the area. Um, my perception is that the motion would put us out of step with agencies in the area. Therefore, I will be voting against the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mangotti. Um, I would just like to voice support for the motion. I think something to note is that although our educational partners may have the land agreement posted in their agenda or in some sort of written form instead of being spoken aloud, I think it's very important for us um, as a governing board that um, in our coming years, we have AB 101, which is our ethnic studies curriculum, and that's something that our students will be going through, and they're gonna be understanding and kind of learning about the history that our country has gone through and the way that it has impacted certain groups, especially marginalized groups. So if we as a group or as a governing board are letting our students go through this curriculum, I think it's very important that our board also does the effort or puts in the extra effort of saying a land agreement for 45 seconds or maybe even like a couple of minutes um, out of our board meeting to kind of acknowledge and respect the people that have come before us. Um, and it kind of just puts the message out there that we are united and we, as well as our students, are trying to move forward and progress um, while also acknowledging our history. So, thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Flynn, you have something to add? I just want to uh, just respond to something that I was actually on the Solano Community College Board when we voted to do that. And I think the key distinction is they did it three years ago. So I think we're a bit behind and I think that we need to really catch up. So I would support the motion. Thank you. Okay, I'll call the question. Um, student preferential vote. In favor. Okay, so aye, all right. And, well, and then all those in favor of the motion. Aye. Those opposed, nay. 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 Okay. Is there a, a different motion that someone would like to make? I, I would love to move approval of the committee's recommendation and resolution in honor of the land acknowledgement. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. Uh, preferential vote? Nay. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. I, that's a nay. Okay. Just one nay. Yes. All right. It's two nays. My my eye meant nay on the resolution. I'm voting against a second no motion. Yeah. Right. I I voted. I'm just to clarify. I'm voting yes because I really am excited about this land acknowledgement. I would prefer for it to be read, but because I do want this done in some form. Yes, I would prefer for this be to revise later, but I do support yes on this motion, although I prefer for the other okay. motion to have passed. Thank, Thank you. you for the clarification. Okay, then we will move on to our action items. Um, we have 11A, which is approval of the third revision to the ESSER 3 expenditure plan. There is no presentation. Is there a motion? Oh, I gotta get a motion first. <laughs> I would move approval. <laughs> Okay, any discussion, uh, Ms. Patero? Yes, we were told, or informed, by the way, during the LCAP that there were $300,000 that were gonna be allocated for supplies, right? Come to find out that $300,000 comes to, uh, equates to $15 a student if we're looking at all of the students in the district. If we cut that in half, that's only $30 a student. That is not enough money for student supplies, for students in need. I have given supplies to teachers. Glue alone just for one week costs more than this per student. So if we're allocating $300,000 in the budget for, uh, for student supplies, will the teachers be allowed to solicit from parents and other entities for, more su for supplies, or are they gonna have to take it out of their paychecks? Is the district going to ensure that when teachers need supplies for their students, they're given supplies? 
It's beyond $300,000. I, I think that this is, I don't know how so, this applies to the SR3 funding. The well, in, in, in the, in the, the, the presentation. I think that that's something, I, I think that that the SR3 funding is going to end September 30th, the $300,000. And I think that that's something that um, we'll have to t consider if they're going to put out the um, supply list. What we expressed last time is that you know the, the students felt that that was somewhat disrespectful when those supply lists went out. But that's up to the board if that's the direction we want to go in the future. Is that, okay. Is that something that we need to? decide now no no this, this is no, one time money has, so next school year it's going to this okay fund. okay yeah. my question was because there's three hundred thousand dollars would the teachers be allowed to ask for, for because up but until this now is, this they weren't already allowed happened. to right yeah this is so, not for uh, so moving so now forward. let's look at next year and hopefully we'll get more than three hundred thousand dollars in supplies for students and i think that that's part of the budget discussion that you would have to consider okay uh, there was a motion and a second, correct? I've, I've lost track. Uh, student preferential vote, please. Aye. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, that motion passes. Um, we have our second interim report. It's in Amanda Rich. Good evening, Board President Smith, Governing Board, and Superintendent Corey. It is my pleasure to present for your review and potential approval our 2023-24 Second Interim Financial Report. Listed here are the various documents included in our Second Interim Report. There are three different certifications a district may self-certify as. Tonight, administration is recommending a positive certification, and that means the district will be able to meet its financial obligations for the current year and two subsequent years. We are projecting a decrease in our unrestricted fund balance of $19.9 million due to carryover of prior year funds that were not fully spent in the previous year projecting a decrease in our restricted fund balance of $54.4 million, and this is also due to the fact that we didn't spend all of our prior year restricted dollars in the previous fiscal year. This gives us a total projected decrease in our general fund balance of $74.4 million. One of the measurements we must do at each budget period is to ensure we are meeting our 3% minimum reserve requirement. So based on our second interim general fund expenditures, 3% is calculated at $12 million. We currently have $16.2 million already set aside in our special reserve, also known as Fund 17. This balance consists of our economic uncertainty and our textbook commitment. And as always, we like to point out that the $16.2 million will not even cover one month of payroll for the size of our district. I am pleased to report our projections reflect a positive cash flow balance at the end of the fiscal year. Borrowing will not be necessary, but if cash does run low, we have these options available to us. Listed here are the budget assumptions used to build our current year budget and our multi-year projection for the two out years. We have the state adopted cost of living adjustment factors and our funded ADA projections for the upcoming years. Some noteworthy changes from first interim to second interim or January 31st. A decrease in salary and benefits are due to the savings of our vacant positions and deficit spending in our current year will reduce available funds in the out years. Based on the current factors as of right now, <laughs> We will need reductions of 13.8 million in 24-25 and 29.3 million in 25-26. So what are our next steps? 
In May, the governor will reveal his May revisions to the state budget. In June, we will review the specific impacts for what that means for us locally. We will present the 24-25 final budget draft on June 20th with potential adoption on June 27th. And with that, administration recommends approval of the 23-24 second interim report. Thank you. All right, is there a motion? Second. Okay, any discussion? Preferential vote? Aye. Okay, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Wilson, did you have something? No, had you called for the vote? No, not yet. <laughs> all right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, and that takes us to our proposed budget reductions for the 24-25 budget year and recommended restorations. Ms. Linnea Grendel. Thank you and good evening, Board President Smith, Governing Board, Superintendent Corey. Tonight, I have before you the proposed budget reductions for the upcoming 24-25 budget year. We went through a pretty lengthy discussion at the last meeting, and this is just a general overview of previously established Governing Board priorities, just for your review. And there were some specific pri priorities that came to the surface during our informational discussion at the last meeting. Uh, we talked a lot about employee compensation, that there are no layoffs in the current uh, budget reduction proposal. We talked a lot about textbook adoptions, deferred maintenance, and technology replacement. So you've just heard and approved the second interim report. Uh, Mrs. Rich and her staff did an excellent job of looking through the current year budget to find some savings. If you recall, back in February, we were actually looking at about $16 million worth of reductions, and now we're, we're at a level of about 13.8. So the recommended list before you here totals about $15 million. Uh, I would recommend the total package for approval. This provides us staff flexibility to pivot as the ever-changing budget um, happens, particularly when we come to the May revise is where we don't know what will happen, but this will provide some flexibility with um, what may happen. At the last meeting, we also talked about going into flexibility and in building the budget of some items for consideration to restore should the budget picture change. Staff would recommend that we would consider those after we completed and approved the unaudited actuals for our current fiscal year so that we would have a more accurate picture of not only how we finally ended the fiscal year to see if there was, were additional funds, but at that point we would also have the state enacted budget for 24-25, so we would know what the where we actually landed for the following year to see what could be considered. There were three items that seemed to rise to the surface that the governing board spoke about. Uh, restoring the commitment for textbook adoptions. As you recall from the last meeting, we did say that there will be an adoption in starting in 25-26 that we would need to be prepared for bringing back the deferred maintenance level to its current level of 1.25%, so taking that small suspension and bringing it back up, and also technology replacement. Staff would like those governing board to consider one additional option as you see here, and that would be the contribution to our other post-employment benefits. What that does is while we move money into that trust, it does twofold. It brings up the assets to allow us to respond to that ever-growing liability for when our employees retire. And by continuing to contribute and allowing it to grow interest, et cetera, 
sometime in the future, we can actually get to a level to where our liability is low enough and our assets are high enough that we can actually begin drawing upon that for our current year other post-employment benefit expenses. We're not there yet, but if we don't contribute, it will take us even longer to get there. So that's, that's a staff recommendation that I would just like to be considered as well. The theme of the budget is constant changes, as you know. So we are actively watching what's going on at the state level to see what they will finally end up at. And as part of that, what our actual statutory cost of living adjustment and what the state will actually fund when we get to the May revise. We're also constantly looking at our changes in enrollment and average daily attendance and adjusting as needed. We're constantly moving. Uh, you just approved the second interim budget. I bring before you tonight the recommendations for the reductions for the following year and possible restorations. We'll hear the information from the May revised workshop. I do want to caution you that by May 20, 21st is after our May governing board meeting. So any information that we may have, um, it won't be necessarily the comprehensive. We can update the governing board in May. But we may, staff may not have some of the finer details um, available to present in May, but to the extent possible, because also by May 21st, we're about 90% completed with the large district budget, and we'll incorporate what we can in the adopted budget. As you know, when you adopt, we adopt the budget, it's already out of date, but we'll do our best to do that. Um, but it will be presented along with our LCAP on June 20th and then final adoption on the 27th. Then once the state uh, adopts its budget and it is fully signed by the governor, any material changes that would affect us locally, we have 45 days to incorporate into our local budget. And with that, staff recommends approval of the budget reductions and potential restorations. So, if the board adopts the recommendation, I'm seeing $3 million for our textbooks, and I'm wondering, will that affect uh, the math adoption that's coming up? And if so, how? Um, as we mentioned at the last meeting, it will affect and impact the future adoptions, and that is why we are um, recommending should the budget outlook improve, that textbooks be part of that um, dollars going into it. And then if we, if even with those um, additional augmentations, if it, you're able to put it back, you're just gonna have to be aware that in the 25-26 school year, um, you're going to have to add that as an expenditure and make additional cuts for that year. And that's why it goes up to 26 million. Right. Um, and I, I, I okay. Uh, my, my issue is that we're, we're cutting 3 million and then we're bringing back 750. And, and I'm concerned about the sufficiency of that in terms of educating our students and helping them to achieve. So I have a problem with it, but thank you. Ms. Patero and then Mr. Flynn. In, in, for, in further consideration in, on this, because we had went from our meeting last, last month, I was thinking more on the deferred maintenance. Now, if we reduce the budget on deferred maintenance, that means facilities go unrepaired, right? Um, we had a report yesterday at the facilities co uh, subcommittee, and um, Tuesday. Tuesday, a couple days ago. Anyway, and um, we presented what would happen, and really uh, it is reducing the deferred maintenance budget by 20%. And um, in the discussion that we had, what, what would more than likely happen is that the cycle that we've created, let's say we've said every seven years a school gets uh, repainted, we might have to extend that to every eight years or every nine years. So that is, um, thankfully, we're not recommending taking all of those, the deferred maintenance dollars that um, 
Uh, board member Tilly is shaking her head because she remembers when that happened back in the recession. Um, and so it still will maintain uh, you know, a, a significant amount that they'll be able to do some of the work. The other great news that um, we've had is some of those ESSER $3 that the, the plan that you just approved. Um, some of the things that we would have done with deferred maintenance in the past, such as carpets and HVACs, we've been able to fund out of the ESSER $3 um, dollars. So they won't be like major facilities that are gonna go un, 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 under maintained or not maintained if we, by, by decreasing the budget by 1%. By by because point I'm, two where by, by two by point two five by two percent by yeah. two point two five so major things like bathrooms and the like won't be affected by this. No. All right, Mr. Flynn, and then Mr. Wilson. I, I do support the staff recommendation tonight. Um, again, while these are very unfortunate cuts, this is the result of a system that is underfunded due to the statewide budget. Um, and I am not envious of our administrators who had to make these decisions. Um, I do want to say to um, the addition of the pension um, dollars, I do support that 100% as my number one priority. I think that the number one challenge our district, as many districts are these continual certificated and classified retention and recruitment crisis. I think that this is something that could help with that. I think it's important that we show to our employees that are committed to ensuring uh, you have a high quality of uh, working conditions that we also are helping to provide for you when you retire. And I think that is very important. And I would, my second priority on there would be the textbook adoption because I think it's important that we have relevant curriculum to keep kids in school and that'll help with our ADA which funds our schools. Um, while I am sympathetic to deferred maintenance and technology replacement, I just don't think that those are as big priorities. I would love to fund them all, but if we only had to pick two, I would prefer the pension and the uh, pension funds and the textbook adoption funds. Thank you. Mr. Wilson. <clears throat> I have some comments, but I'd rather speak in favor of or against a motion. Is a motion appropriate right now? I, I was uh, asking, well, Clarifying questions is what my intent was with calling on folks, but um, if no one else has a clarifying question, then I would entertain a motion. I move we approve the proposed budget reductions. Okay. Second. Okay. Any further discussion necessary? Mr. Wilson. I'd like to speak in favor of the motion, but express my reservations. If the district were an automobile and your, rev your income goes down, uh, if it were a car, you wouldn't, you would maybe drive fewer miles or carry fewer passengers, but you wouldn't stop changing the oil or rotating the tires or uh, replacing anything that breaks or stop saving to replace anything that will predictably wear out. Uh, my, imp my impression, as I've gotten to know the district, is that this district is pretty finely tuned. It, we don't have a lot of fat to cut. We don't have big unknown reserves here and there, and uh, that the program is pretty tight. There's not a lot of room for, uh, for cuts. And my conclusion is that these cuts will put us slightly out of balance. We were not fully prepared to uh, consider the best ways. And I look forward to this summer, July or whenever we take it up, coming up with a plan for the next round of reductions that will let us um, keep things in proportion and keep our finely tuned system and look at all possible and appropriate areas to reduce so that we don't become unhealthy or unbalanced as a district. But I will be supporting the motion. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion? One, one quick one. Just 
on my one of the questions that was posed <coughs> when we look at discussions i think we shouldn't preclude the district office as well because we're making cuts everywhere else but i don't see any cuts coming from the district office i'd like that to be under consideration as well okay if that's all oh, okay Ms. Honey church uh, is there not one uh, full-time administrator uh, district office administrator Reduction? It's just an administrator. It's not district office administrator. Oh, one administrator. Okay. Yeah. We Thank didn't, you. Thank you for the clarification. We didn't issue any layoff notices. We would have had to, ha had that been an identification that we wanted to reduce central office staff or administrators, we would have had to done, conducted lay layoffs. Okay. All right. Uh, then preferential vote, please. Aye. Okay, and all in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes, aye. Any opposed? Aye. Okay. Whoops, I crossed off a thing that we haven't done yet. Um, okay, so next is our resolution authorizing competitive negotiation process for um, EV stations. Is there a motion? Second. Okay, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Oh, did I forget that again? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, okay. Now you've thrown me all off. Okay, so uh, resolution prescribing the terms and authorizing the issuance of sale of 2024 general obligation bond anticipation notes. Um, approving related documents and actions, um, and I haven't been calling for public comment. Nobody's poked me on that yet. <laughs> I don't have any further speakers this evening. Okay, uh, thank you. All right, is there a motion? Okay. Yes. Okay, and any discussion? Ms. Patero. So I looked at the, quest the, the responses on how much it was going to cost in interest for, if we approved this uh, $55 million bond. Uh, ban, and that was going to be an additional was it nine million dollars added to added to the next bond. So the next superintendent is going to be saddled with is going to be short. Now it's going to wind up with 189 million dollars worth of bond because we if we do this ban, and I'm looking at the projects that are going to be done. I, I don't think my question was answered. My my question was that which projects are existing projects. They were not approved on Measure S, and since here all these projects have been, or have been, or in, in design, I'm look and I looked at since I'm not on the on the uh, what do you call it facilities committee anymore. The Army of High School restroom building is only one one building with six stalls in in the, in the women's bathroom and six stalls in the men's bath, three stalls in the men's bathroom and three urinals. This building has three stories, and on every single floor there are bathrooms, and in every single bathroom is at least three stalls serving what less than. 300 people, and so we're looking at this ban for only 600, only one, one, one bathroom. We're looking at Anna Kyle, you want $55 million, the construction of Anna Kyle is going to be a parking lot, right? The PSA main office is going to be main office and parking. So you want us to give $55 million in a ban with a $10 million interest, it's an interest only loan for a building, for an office building and construction on parking lots when we're not thinking about the importance of students who need facilities, clean facilities in which to, 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 um, to use during the time that they're at school. So this 55 million, if, if we're doing $55 million, does it have to be all of these fives or can we just relegate it to one school and, one, and, and fix all of their bathrooms? Because if we're doing $55 million for all of these K.I. Jones Kitchen, Anna Kyle parking lot, a PSA main office, I don't think that warrants an extra $55 million. Why don't we just wait? This is, is this coming, wait. Is this supposed to come out of the 2024 bond, 24 eight bond that we can't use, that we're borrowing against now? I think that's my question. What we're doing is getting basically a cash advance. A cash advance, it's interest only, that's going to be $10 million that we have to pay for, right? And we're going to pay for parking lots. 
Can, Is that right? Can, can I just... I'm just asking, and we're paying for... We want it, yes. an extra $10 can, million dollars in interest paid, paid for a parking lot. Yes, but that um, project also includes the front office, which right now is an unsecured office, which risks student safety. And there is very little parking, which means a lot of on the street parking, which means that the neighborhood is impacted. As a parent of students that went to P PSA, I have lived that pain. Um, I, yeah, but, thank you. I, I understand that. I'm still railing against the fact that we this, this Last bond, $49 million was spent on a, on, a, on a theater when all of this stuff could have been done. Now we're asking the taxpayers to foot another $10 million on a $55 million bond because we're irresponsible for the last bond. That is my big issue on this thing, and I don't support this ban at all. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Tilly. Yeah. Um, I have no problem with the project list. I, the, one of my questions that was answered really well was, um, you know, how will the interest be done, and um, are there any cost savings if we do it now as opposed to later? And I think the answer to that question is yes. In fact, there are significant savings, and um, I'd rather keep momentum and move forward with those projects that can have an effect. Um, school safety is of great concern to me. Having, uh, it's been one of the great movements of this board and district to um, campus by campus improve student safety, you know, and improve the experience coming in one point of entry. Uh, Anna Kyle has not had much work done for a long, long time. It's going to be expensive. I mean, that school's got to be at least 50 years old. So I'm all in favor of this ban. And I think that it's, um, even though we are charged interest, I think that it is appropriate to take the lower cost now in order to continue the good work that we're doing versus waiting until later and paying higher interest because that's going to be there regardless of when the sale occurs. So this to me is fiscally very responsible and I recommend it. Mr. Flynn and then Mr. Polk. And I just want for clarification, so I am very sympathetic to the higher interest. I really don't like paying that, but I just, I want to clarify that I believe what ISIM advisors told us was that that construction rates are going up 10 to 12 percent every year, and it is roughly 50 million dollars. So, I, it, to me, it's kind of like we're sa paying a little bit here, but we're saving more in the long run. So I do support this. Um, however, I do understand my fiduciary role as a trustee, and I do want to. Um, do everything I can to make sure those dollars are well spent and working with both the administration and our oversight committee and trusting the work that they do as well. Mr. Polk? Uh, the, uh, what we're trying to do is get a jump start on uh, what we promised we would do. And the, this board has made the priorities. With respect to that one particular parking lot, this is a completion of a project that began five years ago. We're completing the transition from A.B. Blank as, a middle, uh, as an elementary school to the Public Safety Academy. It will all be, always be called A.B. Blank. But the one big thing that we have not been able to do is to improve the office. And the office is just wonderful for a 1950 elementary school. It's totally inadequate for the kind of program we're running at, at the Public Safety Academy, which is the premier school we, in our district right now. Um, the parking lot is built for 1950, and we need to move on completing this project and making the Public Safety Academy whole for the first time ever. Uh, it is our primary, I mean, our premier school right now. We've got to get started on Amy, uh, on Kyle, Anna Kyle. It has been delayed and delayed and delayed. And it's only now that we have Measure S Bunny that we can start working on that project. Today, now, is better than waiting two years to do that. Two years is going to be increased in costs for construction. 
we need to start work on overhauling completely the CTE program and buildings at Army Oak. All of these things are desperately needed, and we've said these are our priorities. Let's get on with it. Um, fortunately, we have an op option of choosing to use bands, and a band will allow us to move forward. Sure, it costs some interest, right? But it's better to have delay in two years and have the increased of construction cost on all of these projects to come in. So I'm in favor of this. We need to start it. Mr. Wilson. <clears throat> I'm grateful to the district for providing us a detailed explanation in our detailed agenda, explaining that it's a form of municipal bridge loan to be used to continue improvements on educational facilities at today's construction market cost rather than endure escalation costs due to rising construction market prices, etc. There's quite a bit more. I'm glad that we're given ample information well ahead of time. And I'm also glad that our protocols ask us to submit questions on meeting agenda items well ahead of time, which I make use of that and I'm glad we have that provision it helps to streamline our meetings so that um, we don't need to discuss things that have been explained to us or that we have had ample opportunity to get answers on. Thank you. And I will be speaking in favor of the motion. Thank you. Yes, there has, there has been a motion and a second. Um, yes, uh, preferential vote? Aye. Okay, and all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Oh, see, that was an example of what I'm going to ask you not to do, which is speaking without your microphone on. If you could, when you, when you make a motion could or a second, can you, can you uh, make sure to turn on your microphone, please, so that they can catch it um, on the audio recording? <laughs> do they not hear me that that? No, one. no, no. I, I just accidentally turned off my mic when I, I meant to turn it on, but no, if we get... <laughs> no worries. When motions are being made, um, please. Okay. Um, all right. So we have a resolution for uh, granting an easement to PG&E for uh, Mary Bird. Is there a motion? Move approval. Second. Any discussion? Preferential vote? Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, and we have a resolution designating specific materials, products, things, or services to be used uh, uh, for use at designated project site. Um, it feels very vague, but I will call for a motion. <laughs> I'll move, move approval. Okay. And uh, any discussion? Okay, preferential vote? Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Uh, resolution requesting the treasurer to make constitutional advance of anticipated tax revenues. No presentation. Is there a motion? Move approval. Second. Okay. And any discussion? Preferential vote? Aye. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> You're I young at heart, Perry. I have a preference. <laughs> have a preference. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes. Um, we have a review and potential approval of the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee report for the 2023 calendar year. I suppose in the future we may have that listed twice, right, for Measure J and Measure S, but this is Measure J, correct? We have approval. Second. Okay. Uh, any discussion? I'm sorry. Who, who, who made the motion? motion? Tilly. Harry. Harry. Oh, Harry. And then. And Tilly. Well, and Tilly. every year we hear from the bond oversight committee, <laughs> but every month, or at least every other month, and sometimes only on quarters, the board over the bond oversight committee is hard at work. They are our. Uh, 
our counterbalance to make sure that the monies that are set aside for bonds are spent correctly. They do wonderful work. Having spent many years on that committee, I can testify to that. And um, this is a hard working committee. And I, you note that the committee report is very lengthy. The wonderful thing is that you can count off as you go through that report when projects are completed and are certified by the Bond Oversight Committee as being using the money properly. I want to move approval. I, I think it already has I already been moved. did. <laughs> she liked it so much, she did it twice. Um, okay, uh, any other discussion? Preferential vote? Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, that motion passes. And we have a uh, review and potential approval of the CEQA exemptions for upcoming projects. Uh, is there a motion? Is that Patero and Move approval, Mandotti? Patero. Well, the preferential we'll vote issue? Yeah. Okay, you'll go back and fix it on, on yeah, the back end, back though? I'm okay. Make it duty for right now. We're gonna make it later. Yes, <laughs> they will go back and fix that. Okay, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that motion passes. Um, we are, oh, which one? I don't even know what the number is on this. 12J, um, 12J through T are bids. We took Q and S off the agenda, so is there a motion to approve those as a slate, minus Q and S? I'd like to move to approve uh, 12J2T minus Q and S. Second. Okay, any discussion? Preferential vote? Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes. Right, sorry, let me get to where my page is. I tagged it just in case you guys were on board. Um, okay, and now we have a public hearing. It is the um, disclosure of the initial approval of FSUSD to CSEA uh, Chapter 302 and the Sunshine. And so I will open the public hearing. We had nobody with public comment on our records, so I will close the public hearing. We will then do the review and potential approval of the Sunshine. Is there a Move motion? approval. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Ms. Mon you got it? Okay. Uh, preferential vote? Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that motion passes. We have another public hearing, which is the initial proposal from CSEA Chapter 302 to FSUSD for sunshining for next year. I will open the public hearing. And the public hearing is closed. And now we have the review and potential approval of said sun. Move said approval. Shun. I Second. can't talk. Thank you for stopping that. <laughs> uh, okay, and then... Uh, Second, Judy. Thank you. Um, any discussion? All right, preferential vote? Aye. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, and... Which, I'm sorry, which one am I on? E. They all look the same. E. Thank you. Okay, we have a resolution authorizing employment of instructors to teach on a pro provisional move a, move internship approval. permit. <laughs> I'm sorry, who was the second? Uh, Brad Tilly. Okay, and any discussion? Preferential vote? Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And we'll move on to review and potential approval of a resolution authorizing employment on a variable term waiver. Move Second. approval. Second. Okay. And um, any discussion? Preferential vote? She seconded. Aye. I know, but she still has to vote. <laughs> um, 
All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes. Um, we have the student school calendar for the 25-26 school year. Is there a motion? Move approval. Second. Okay. Discussion? Okay. Uh, preferential vote? Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, and we have the revised certificated substitute salary schedule. Is there a motion? We have approval. Second. Okay, any discussion? Preferential vote? Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, and that's the last of our action items, so no more motions today, folks. Um, so we now have the update on the development of the 24 through 27 local control and accountability plan. Dr. Sheila McCabe. You're not alone. Good evening, Superintendent Corey. Board President Smith and members of the Governing Board, I'm delighted to be presenting tonight an update to our development of the 24 through 27 Local Control and Accountability Plan. And at the conclusion of this presentation, I am going to ask for direction from the Board regarding a couple of the items related to the goals in our new plan. Just as a reminder, the LCAP, or Local Control and Accountability Plan, is a tool where we set our goals plan actions, and leverage our resources in order to improve student outcomes. The plan is a three-year plan, but it is rewritten and revised each year during this upcoming three-year period. While it is a local plan, it is required by the state that we align it to eight priorities, which you see listed on this sheet. These are the same eight priorities that I believe our last three or four LCAPs have been aligned to. So now our goals. This year we have had six goals that um, focus on our educational program, social emotional learning, recruiting and retaining staff, school climate and culture, parent family community engagement. And the sixth goal was one that we added this past year that was required by the state of California because we had two student achievement groups that we were not making progress on at the rate the state wanted us to make progress on. And that was meeting the needs of our students receiving special education services as well as our unsheltered youth. That expectation from the state has gone away with the new LCAP, and so we're recommending no longer having that goal, but instead embedding those actions within other goals that we have. But instead, the state has added a new requirement regarding goals, and that is to have a goal specifically to what they're calling the equity multiplier schools in the district. And an equity multiplier school is a school that has a high percentage of students that receive um, free and reduced lunch, which is um, interesting to calculate because all of our students receive that, but there are certain students that qualify for it, as well as a school that has a high mobility rate. The only school in the district that meets that criteria at this point in time is San Diego High School. And so they receive additional funding from the state because they have a high mobility rate and a high percentage of students who are um, socioeconomically disadvantaged. And so we have to have a specific goal to address the needs of the students at that school. That will become our new goal six. So we've been meeting with our LCAP advisory committee um, since January. And our LCAP advisory committee includes parents, students, um, staff, classified, certificated, uh, classified um, staff, we have certificated administrators as well as our teaching staff, and then we also have representatives from our um, APA, our psychology unit. And so we've been going over the goals that we currently have, and we started with getting information on what they saw as potential modifications to these goals. So our first goal is around the educational program, and the only recommendation that they had to our current language is to change the and in the statement of college and career to an and they felt that it was important to switch that to an or because it recognized really that importance of being career ready was just as important as being college ready and that a student might be one or the other and not necessarily both college and career ready. There was also some discussion in the LCAP advisory committee about changing the term graduates from the term graduates to um, completing high school, 
But I will tell you that as we met with other groups to get input on it, many felt that it was important we kept the word graduate because you can still graduate with a certificate of completion or graduate with a diploma. And that to change it to complete would imply you could go to high school for four years and met this requirement. And we know that that's not the case. In regards to the goal around social emotional learning, there were no recommended changes to that goal. For hiring and retaining staff, um, the committee felt that it was very important that we change the word aggressive to competitive. They felt like that was a, a kinder, gentler, but yet still meaningful word. And then also to do some modification in how that last part of the um, phrase was written. In terms of climate, they actually recommended a, a quite large change, which I thought was interesting because it, took, it takes us back closer to what we had three years ago. When the committee met three years ago and came up with the language around school climate, it was important to that group that we had two very different discussions as part of climate. One was around the learning environment, and then one was around the work environment for staff. This committee felt like it was more important to have it as one group to really talk and, and look at it in terms of a united group working together to meet the needs of the students. And so their recommendation was to um, make the changes as you see on this slide. In terms of parent, family, and community engagement, their recommendation was to remove the word parent because they felt like that was really redundant with the concept of family, that parents are part of the family and, and really wanted to um, emphasize the fact that this is really engaging the entire family. And then also to look at it in terms of the goal of this was to promote transformative relationships with our family and with our community partners. So that's one piece that once we get into discussion, if there's any questions or concerns regarding it, I will say that I reviewed this presentation um, Tuesday night with the LCAP Advisory Committee and they affirmed that yes, the language that we have on the slides is consistent with how the majority of the LCAP Advisory Committee felt. The second piece of what we need to get direction on is the goal order. If you recall, when we wrote the, the LCAP three years ago, the goals have to go in what is perceived to be the priority order for the district. And at that point in time, the LCAP Advisory Committee had a lot of discussion around whether the high quality educational programs, educational options should be our number one goal, or whether social emotional learning should be. And at that point in time, the committee recommended that social emotional learning should be the number one goal, and the governing board concurred, and that became the number one goal of the LCAP. We are coming back now three years later and having more discussion around what our number one goal should be. And so we began asking not only our LCAP advisory committee, but our student leaders, our student advisory council, and our parent leaders, and our district English learner advisory committee. And it was interesting because it was a um, heavy discussion in each one of those groups. The LCAP advisory committee ultimately recommended that the number one goal be the educational program goal. I will tell you it was not unanimous. I would say it was about um, two thirds wanting it to be educational goal and one third wanting it to remain with the social emotional learning. Our parents and our DLAC committee wanted the social emotional learning to be the number one goal. Our student leaders and student advisory council wanted the educational program to be the number one goal. And in that case, it was much more overwhelming that the students were wanting the educational program to be the number one goal. So the direction that we're needing from you tonight is again, whether or not the language recommendations from the LCAP Advisory Committee is acceptable to the board and whether or not um, you have a, a desire to look at either social emotional learning or the high quality educational program as the number one goal, recognizing that the other will be the number two goal. So it doesn't mean the other goal disappears, it just is which one is number one and which one is number two in the LCAP as well as in every one of the school's um, single plans for student achievement. With that, I turn it back over to you, Ms. Smith. Okay. Uh, Mr. Wilson? This is an information item, so we won't be voting, but I, I understand that we're, uh, the, the, the district is hoping to get the sense of the board on that question of which goal to put first priority. So I will speak to that. But first, um, I'm uh, grateful that uh, the work has been done among the various stakeholder groups, and I like the proposed changes to the goals that I see on these slides, and I'm grateful for the people that are willing to put in the time, our community. I see this as kind of near the heart of what the school board is about, is this LCAP, and 
I'm, uh, I'm heartened to see that the community groups have a stake in it. And they have given us several revisions on that last question, which goal to put number one or number two. Um, I, <clears throat> you know, slides nine and 10 contain the full text of each. And when I put those side by side, I cannot uh, say that social emotional is higher than the educational program. Although, I cannot, uh, you know, uh, learning or mentally healthy, how do you choose? I, I, I find that, you know, but if we cannot combine them in some way, then I would pr prioritize first, execute an equitable, high quality educational program and provide educational options to ensure every student graduates high school, college, or career ready, and subordinate to that. Second, implement a tiered integrated social emotional program to support the well being of all students and staff by promoting pro social behavior, teaching, coping, and decision making skills, and modeling positive relationships. I just, I wish there were some way to combine them, you know, uh, but. Um, if there isn't, I would, uh, my opinion would be to put the educational program above, although, I, you know, it's, uh, it's just very important that our teaching be in emotion, in supportive environments and not, I don't know. Anyway, I've said enough. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Tilly and then Ms. Patero and then Mr. Polk. Uh, I think the language changes are brilliant um, and uh, support them fully. Uh, and there's no question in my mind that high quality educational uh, programs and opportunities need to be our number one goal. All you got to do is look at our dashboard, folks. Ms. Patero? I just have a question on the uh, college or career ready. Does that, is that going to impact the curriculum? Does that mean students who are, do, who are in the CTE curriculum uh, pathway are a career pathway, are they going to be subject to different classes? Is it going to be a completely different curriculum? Are they doing the same I curriculum? I don't believe be this uh, has anything to do with curriculum. It is just goals, our overarching goals that drive our decisions as to Yeah, I understand that. My question is, if, it's going to, if you're going to be career or college ready, does that mean that, you, that what they're taught is going to be different? Are they going to be on parallel tracks or are they going to be yeah. taught the same thing? They're just, they're just the language, is it no. just, they're just, going to be career or? Yeah, yeah, it's just the conjunction. Mm, interesting. Mr. Polk. We, uh, some years ago, we adopted a logo that says a premier learning community that empowers each student to, provide, or to thrive in an ever-changing world. We need to say that high-quality education is the way we get to be a, primary, uh, a premier learning community. So I think we need to reverse those two goals for sure, emphasizing high quality education and make that as what we need to focus on. Okay. Others, uh, Ms. Honeychurch and then Mr. Flynn. Okay, I, I too um, support all of the language changes. I thought they were well done. And I agree with my other colleagues that uh, having a high educational qualification uh, a high quality education should be our number one goal. Mr. Flynn? I too also support um, the high qual, I support uh, the, all the language changes. And there was one specific line that really drew to me, which was promoting transformative relationships. Um, some of my colleagues may remember, we listened to a very inspirational presentation at CSBA from uh, Dr. Sean Ginwright about how transformative relationships can have a, such a great power on, um, our, on student success. So I support that. And not only do I support it, I'm extremely excited and thrilled about it. So, and then when it comes to the choice, again, both are very important, both are critical. However, I agree with the rest of my colleagues that uh, we have to always support academic success as our number one goal. That is our goal of a school district. That is what the voters have entrusted each one of us to provide. So I do support a high quality uh, educational services as the number one goal, while also realizing that the number two goal, social emotional learning, is also important. Um, so I support both and I agree with my colleagues. Thank you. Okay. Well, 
Well, um, I would also concur. I um, do, I approve the language changes. I think they are for the good. Um, and I would also echo that I believe education is what we're here for, and that should be top of our list. I would say that, um, as Dr. McCabe mentioned, it was three years ago that the uh, social-emotional was boosted to the top, and that was a very timely situation with coming back from the pandemic, and um, you know, people were struggling, um, adults, children, you know, every, everybody was with that. So I do think that now this is another timely change to make, which is um, bringing back the, um, the education to the forefront. And it doesn't mean that the other goes away. It just means that we stress the importance of the education that students are here to receive. And Ms. Tilly, yes. Another reason that I'm supporting switching the goals is, to, is acknowledging, you know, our district's done a great job with implementing the multi-tiered systems of support. Um, we've done so much learning and training and acting on addressing uh, behavioral issues that our schools and our teachers have had to deal with as a direct result of the pandemic restrictions. And so part of the reason that I feel safe in de-emphasizing that is the success of the social emotional learning programs that we have now and the belief that those will continue and strengthen. So I'm not, I'm not afraid, that, it's not that they're not important, I just wanted to stress that, you know, our district should be proud, our teachers and our administrators should be proud of what they've done in terms of shifting the conversation and supporting our students as they uh, have to relearn how to be good students and good citizens. So I'm very proud of that. But I still support academic achievement. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll move on to our next info item, uh, which is the review of the financial statement ending January of 2024. Any discussion? Um, okay, and we have a um, CSEA, Chapter 302, uh, oh, this is a different group. <laughs> uh, Sunshining their collective bargaining agreement for 24-25, any discussion? Well, there's no, oh, no yeah. motion. <laughs> yeah. And with that, that comes to communication, and we have employee organization reports. Pam Williamson, I see. Yeah, so good evening. Um, and it's been a really interesting day. Spring has, and behaviors are all over, and we're having fun every single day. Um, so with that, that, that is great. I am enjoying the warmer weather, getting outside, so that's pretty cool. Um, we also have heard tonight about the second interim and waiting for the May revised. We understand the budget issue but we also are knowing that we are in the middle of bargaining and we are looking forward to a fair and beneficial contract um, for not only our current teachers, but being able to take care of our new hires that come. So we're really working on that piece and I just want to wish you all a restful and safe spring break. We would like to wish you a very happy birthday. Mm -hmm. Yes, happy birthday. I wish I had a spring break. <laughs> uh, okay, and then we have a written report. The student board member report. Oh, I'm sorry. I totally overlooked that at the bottom there. Uh, student board member report. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Superintendent Corey, Board President uh, Smith, and Governing Board members. Not much has changed since my last report out. The Student Advisory Council is still working on their proposals for the upcoming presentation, Student Voices presentation, um, and that's pretty much it. Thank you all, have a great rest of your evening, and I hope you have a great spring as well. All right, now we have the Governance Subcommittee meeting minutes. <laughs> um, 
that are there for your review. And then that brings us to adjournment. And I will ask you to pause for a second as we adjourn the meeting in honor and memory of Mitchell Dwayne Jones, former FSUSD teacher, Leo Joseph Giovanetti, retired FSUSD teacher, Cindy Noble, retired FSUSD teacher, Carol Bazook, retired Bazook, excuse me, retired FSUSD teacher, Sandra, Sandra Junti, retired FSUSD teacher, and Sue Bell, retired FSUSD teacher. May they rest in peace and may their memories be a blessing. We're adjourned.